Uh, we are here with Dan Lee, CEO of Full House Resorts and the largest shareholder in Full House Resorts, I might add, uh, which is a small regional casino uh, operator. Uh, and Dan, uh, appreciate your time. Mm -hmm. Happy to be here. And um, I guess being 2020, we have to start with the question of the year, which is how is COVID, uh, COVID affecting your operations and how do you see it working out both for Full House and for the industry in the near to midterm? Um, well, COVID, uh, it was very frightening at first because, uh, um, you know, we're, we're diverse. We have five different casinos around the country. And you always expect there to be uh, acts of God in one place or another, like a, a hurricane in the Gulf Coast or a snowstorm in Colorado or something. Uh, but you never expect to have to shut everything down all at once. And, uh, and we didn't know how long it would be closed. We didn't know um, when, when we reopened, under what circumstances, and whether the customers would reappear and everything else. So, so I would say the spring was pretty frightening. Um, and, uh, you know, because you still owe interest on your debt and you still owe real estate taxes on the buildings. And so even closed, there's pretty significant costs. But we reacted pretty strongly and, and uh, cut our expenses as much as we could really pretty much to the bone. Uh, and then we had uh, uh, in two months where everything was closed. Um, it was reminiscent to me of when we had had hurricanes uh, when I was at Pinnacle down on the Gulf Coast and your casino gets uh, hurt by the hurricane. And then there's a period of time while the construction people are kind of fixing it so you can reopen and you can, you can revisit how you operate it. And we did that over those uh, two months and thought about uh, every position. Did we need uh, the staffing we had? Did we need um, uh, the, the marketing programs we had? Did we, there were a lot of sacred cows that, that had been around the company for a long time that we got rid of. Um, you know, we had a 49 cent breakfast in Colorado that had been there for 25 years and everybody was scared to touch that. And we eliminated it and, and, uh, and we're fine. And so when we were allowed to reopen, um, we only have half the slot machines. Um, we still don't have table games in Colorado. Um, we scaled back on the marketing and so on. And uh, frankly, the customers showed up and they showed up very well. And I, I have a saying I've been using a large part of my career that uh, slot machines don't gamble, people gamble. And I use it a lot when when our slot managers come and say they want to, you know, add 20 more machines to the right. floor. I was like, figure out how to add 20 more people to the floor. That will get higher revenue. And, and, and that's been absolutely proven. We're, we're doing pretty much the same revenues with, you know, 40% fewer slot machines. And, uh, um, and so uh, frankly, business has been pretty good. Now, fortunately, nobody flies to our places. We, we have, we have no nightclubs. We have very little meeting and convention business. We have very few people fly to our properties. We're the local places. And, and in many cases, we're operating in places where you don't have uh, other entertainment competition. Um, you can't go to live sports. You can't uh, go to movie theaters, or you may, not, you may choose not to go to movie theaters. And I think our customers realize that, that you can make a casino uh, COVID safe, if you will. You turn off every other slot machine. And, and frankly, we, in the Konami system, we even have it set up now. If somebody's done playing the slot machine, it will not work for the next person until somebody comes and sanitizes it and they have to put in an employee code and then it comes back on. So we can, we can keep everybody six feet apart. We can sanitize everything. Um, and, uh, uh, and so it ends up being a safe entertainment uh, experience. And so far, we're doing really well. And, and I think uh, some of that is probably sustainable because uh, we did just install the Konami system, which is frankly the state-of-the-art slot system. We had just installed it in Colorado and in Indiana, replacing 20-year-old uh, systems that were very out of date. Um, during uh, the closure period, we reinvented their slot clubs and came out with completely different promotions, completely different way of thinking about the customer uh, and introduced that. And it's done very well since. Um, we reevaluated the staffing levels and I think we're, 
sustainable at where we are now, which is significantly below last year. Um, now, we'll, we'll uh, uh, as movie theaters reopen, as vaccines come out and people are feel more comfortable about, comfortable about traveling, you know, we'll, we'll certainly have some challenges. Uh, but from where we're sitting now, uh, several of our properties have had the best months in their history uh, since we reopened. So you know what? that's good to hear. Uh, you mentioned Colorado. You had a project to transform Bronco Billies and Cripple Creek into a destination quality uh, property. Uh, and you had to put that on hold because of COVID. Where does that stand now? Well, we did put it on hold. Um, we're watching still. I mean, we're, we're still not completely out of the woods until they have a vaccine and have distributed it. We're all at risk of another spike and, and we, we can end up being closed again. So we're, we're operating pretty cautiously. We have used uh, this time though to, to uh, look at that project and figured out ways, we have figured out some ways we can improve it from what it was. Uh, and so I've actually got architects redesigning certain parts of it uh, to make it better. And uh, you know, our intent is still to build it, but I think we have to get past this COVID period before, before we get comfortable enough that we're not going to end up closed again. You, you wouldn't want to start a construction project and then find out that you have no, uh, uh, no business uh, being open. You know? uh, so. One of the other growth opportunities is Waukegan, Illinois, north of uh, Chicago, yes. uh, where you are one of the applicants for a casino right. license there. And I think you have a, what you might call a unique approach. So maybe you could describe what you're proposing in Waukegan and also handicap your chances of winning that license. <laughs> I don't know, but it, it uh, uh, actually it was, it was very reminiscent of something I've encountered previously in my career. Um, 15 years ago, um, the state of Louisiana had one gaming license left and I was able to secure it in uh, Lake Charles, Louisiana, uh, which is the closest place to have casinos to Houston. Now, Lake Charles had had casinos for many years. Um, they weren't very special. They were riverboat casinos that were now tied up to a dock and you know, they had some restaurants, but it wasn't, wasn't special. Um, and then a few years after that, uh, uh, St. Louis put out a request for a proposal for another casino. And it was kind of the same thing. And, and uh, in both of those markets, we went in and brought some Las Vegas style to it. Um, having worked with Steve Wynn for years, Steve Wynn always had this uh, saying, he would say that if you, if you surround a casino with good amenities, it makes it a much stronger business. Uh, you know, it's, it's not just about the casino. It's also about having a nice hotel and a swimming pool and a volcano and pirate battle and all that stuff. So, when we went to Lake Charles, we built La Berge, which had an 18 hole golf course and a big selection of restaurants. And we carefully designed the, the floating casino so that the customer never knew it was floating. Um, didn't feel like a riverboat, um, had a spa, had a lazy river. And uh, when we went to St. Louis, we actually built two places, one in downtown St. Louis with the Four Seasons Hotel uh, and, a, and a tunnel connection right over to the convention center and one in South St. Louis, which uh, paid homage to the history of St. Louis and so on. Well, when you go to Chicago, they've had casinos for a long time. They're not very special because they were limited in number and they were limited in size. So they, they really just built shoe boxes with slot machines in them that would appeal to the people who, who, who are really kind of more avid gamblers. And I saw an opportunity here to build something that's more special than that, uh, that has attractions. We have a big fountain attraction. Uh, they actually dropped the tax rate on table games. So we're proposing to build a, a version of what MGM has at the mansion. Uh, and 20 rooms, only 20 rooms, very small hotel. There's several hotels near us with, with perfectly fine hotel rooms that we could put regular customers at. But for a high roller, we will have the best hotel in the entire Chicago area with only 20 rooms. Every room with a, a butler and so on. Um, and a high-end table game area, high-end restaurant. Uh, we have a, an entertainment venue and so on. So we're bringing a bit of Las Vegas to Waukegan, Illinois. And uh, I, I had a conversation the other day with a fellow from Lake Charles. And he said, you know, I, I had changed Lake Charles in ways I never imagined. And I said, what do you mean? He says, well, we, have, we were kind of down on ourselves. We felt like we were behind the petrochemical plants. 
And when the bears are open, all of a sudden we're like, holy cow, look what we have. And he says, Lake Charles became the fastest growing MSA in the country for about five years because they, they had a, a self-confidence. Well, when I go to Waukegan, it feels that then. Everybody almost apologizes that you're in Waukegan. You know, the, the, the factories have moved out. It's a, a down and out town on the, on the shore of Lake Michigan. I look at it as it's midway between Chicago and Milwaukee, right off the freeway. What a great place to build a, a, a place for people to go. Give them a reason to go. Build them something special. And they will go and they will transform the town. And... Uh, the mayor of Lake Charles said to me the other day, he says, you know, you can look at this lots of ways. He says, but what you did for Lake Charles is we have a AAA bond rating and we get a brand new fire truck every year and they cost $1.2 million each. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I, I mean, so I, the, the city had hired a consultant and said we had by far the best proposal. Now it was ambitious for the size of our company um, but we, we know where we can line up partners and financing and get it done. And, 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 uh, uh, and so I think we have a reasonable chance on this. Now, you know, we have some uh, uh, strong competition, uh, including a, a well-known developer who lives in Chicago, who's teamed up with Churchill Downs, but he has the casino down the road. So he has an incentive to just stifle the competition. That's not necessarily what's best. <clears throat> for Waukegan or for the state. And so I think if it's a straight up process, I think we have a, a reasonable chance. Yeah, great. Um, and talking about growth opportunities, uh, you have a referendum coming up in Colorado in two weeks in which the citizens of Colorado are going to vote to authorize the citizens of the, uh, the three casino towns to make their own decisions about what a bet limit should be or whether there should be one at all, what kind of table games should be allowed, meaning if it, if it passes, you'd get more table games. Can you tell us a little bit about what your expectation is for the success of that referendum and also what impact it would have on your operations there? I think the referendum has a very good chance of passing. Uh, the citizens of Colorado have, have passed almost everything that uh, helped these towns. Uh, they did not approve um, slots at the racetrack at Arapahoe Downs, but I think they realized that that would have undercut the success that the Gaming Act had in resurrecting these almost ghost towns that existed up in the mountains. And so the, the very purpose of legalizing casino gaming in Colorado was to help these former mining towns that were almost ghost towns to help them come back. And so every time the industry has gone to voters with uh, different ways to improve it, uh, the voters have uh, backed uh, the, those towns in making those improvements. So I think there's a reasonably good chance that it passes. Um, you know, the, right now the maximum bet is $100. That actually accommodates most gambling. Okay, so if that goes away uh, so that uh, wealthier people uh, could gamble more, um, uh, that's obviously a plus. Now, the existing Bronco Billies today is, is a fairly simple casino, but what we intend to do with it will make it uh, a, a four-star, four-diamond type of place. Uh, and so then it could be important in terms of what we intend to do. The, uh, the, the other games is really kind of about Baccarat, because we already have roulette and craps and blackjack, um, Baccarat and other specialty games that, that come along. Um, and uh, there's really no reason not to have Bakura. And, uh, and if, if uh, Bakura tends to be an Asian game, there's not a large Asian population in Denver, but there is some. Uh, or if somebody comes in from out of state and wants to play Bakura, why, why shouldn't it be allowed? So I, 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 think, uh, I think it's certainly a plus, but it's not a huge plus. It's a, it's a, it's a plus at the margin. So. One of the things that we, st we like to point out is that but Denver is a big feeder market for Las Vegas, but that if you had some of the casinos with some of those amenities, as well as the bet limits in the games, that you might be able to get some of more of that upscale business. Right, and I think part of the reason why um, our business is strong there now is that people are hesitant to get on an airplane. So right. like you say, it's a feeder market now. Now, cholera, that's more a factor of Denver, which has 4 million people and growing fast. All of Colorado's growing 
it's it's kind of become the new Texas. You know, if you, if you think back, California was growing in leaps and bounds in what the seventies and eighties, and then Texas was growing in leaps and bounds and still is to a large extent. Uh, but Colorado is is just on fire. Every place you drive, there's housing developments being built and so on. It's 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 been discovered as a great place to live. Um, Colorado Springs is an hour south of Denver, and Cripple Creek tends to go to Colorado Springs. Uh, that's the connection. Uh, we're two hours from Denver. Well, Blackhawk is one hour from Denver. So people from Denver tend to go Blackhawk. People from Colorado Springs tend to go uh, to Cripple Creek. Um, there isn't great air service between Colorado Springs and Las Vegas. So that Las Vegas effect is, is a little less on Cripple Creek than it is on Denver. Um, uh, and uh, for what it's worth, but, but the gaming per capita in Colorado Springs is substantially less than it is in Denver. Now, Denver is substantially less than the US average. So I think there's growth in the gaming per capita in Denver, and there's a lot of growth to be had in the gaming per capita in Colorado Springs. So I think both Blackhawk and Cripple Creek have, have bright futures. Um, uh, Denver is probably bigger as an opportunity in total dollars, but Cripple Creek is a bigger opportunity in percentage of growth that can happen. And the populations of Denver and Colorado Springs are growing amongst the fastest growing cities in the country. So, so you have two things layering in the growth opportunity. You have a growing population and a growing propensity to gamble per capita. And, uh, and so I think there's a lot of opportunity there. You may not be aware, but we have also been working for a few years to line up the entitlements to expand the Silver Slipper. And the last time we built the simple hotel tower there, it helped uh, drive the EBDIT from uh, uh, high single digits up to the mid-teens. And, uh, uh, and we do look out in the not too distant future at the possibility of adding another tower there. And uh, so we, we've got a lot of different growth opportunities in the it's a small company with a lot of opportunity. Right. I, uh, yeah, Silver Slipper actually is on my list. Do you, do you have a, an issue of conflict on the land and your landlord and that sort of thing there? Well, he, he the same landlord has, uh, we rent it to him under a long-term lease and, and we have the right to buy him out under certain circumstances and at a, at a price that's reasonably favorable. Um, I think that we he agreed to waive rent during the pandemic. We agreed not to exercise our option to buy him out for a period of time, like another two years if I recall. But, but long term, we're, we probably will own that. Um, he has a different piece of land a few miles down the road that is mostly swamp, and he went and got that approved for casino gaming. I don't think the economics work for somebody to build a new casino on the Gulf Coast and really anywhere on the Mississippi Gulf Coast. The last one was a Scarlet Pearl, and the return they got on investment was pretty uh, anemic. Um, ironically, the, the numbers work to add a hotel tower because you already have the installed base of the casino and the front desk and so on. So the numbers work pretty well to expand an existing casino, but they don't work very well to build a new casino. Now, having said all of that, we also had a, a right of first refusal to buy that land if we chose to buy it. So I'm, I'm not really concerned about that, but I, so. Um, if COVID is the word of the year, the second word of the year is sports betting. Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe followed up on that is mobile betting. Uh, you now have sports betting legal, I think in every state that you operate. Uh, what is the impact going to be on pool house? Well, it's, it's, uh, um, it's legal in different ways. We have a on-site sports book in Mississippi, but they do not yet have mobile sports betting uh, statewide. Um, that uh, it's a very nice amenity. It does quite well. Um, I think it's uh, not even 5% of our income, um, but it's, it's a nice amenity and we're happy to have it. In uh, uh, Colorado and Illinois, uh, Colorado and Indiana, uh, mobile sports betting is permitted. And we also have on-site. Well, the on-site numbers are, are not a big number again, especially since you can make a bet on your phone, right? So, so why track to the casino to make a bet? You can just do it on an app on your phone. Now, um, the online websites have to be affiliated with a brick and mortar casino. And, and so um, the way the laws worked, we ended up with uh, three skins they're called, we think of it as websites, in each of Indiana and Colorado. 
we chose not to do it ourselves. We don't have the the, the expertise, and and uh, and and frankly, I, I get worried that that uh, one of the local sports teams ends up in the Super Bowl, and if if the other team is not one of our local teams, we we have an unbalanced book. So a bigger company can deal with that; a small company can't. So instead, we entered into deals with uh, Wynn, Churchill Downs, and Smarkets, which is a substantial British company, um, that they're operating websites that we get a percentage of the revenue. There's a minimum guarantee on that. They're not all up and running now. We have two up now and five to go, uh, four to go. Um, when they're all up and running, our minimum guarantees are seven million a year, and it's virtually all profit. And uh, uh, for a company whose EBDIT is in the low 20s, it's pretty substantial um, uh, just by kind of licensing the right to operate it. So now on the online gaming, that's actually a bigger business. If you look at uh, New Jersey, it's substantially bigger um, and, and quite successful. Not yet legal where we operate, but that is something we probably could do on our own because that that's people basically playing a slot machine or playing blackjack on their iPad. And that's a large number of independent statistical events. And it has a very predictable outcome. Well, that's the business we're already in. Whereas sports betting, there's a lot of betting, but there aren't that many independent statistical events. And the Super Bowl is a pretty big chunk of all the betting. And so, um, you know, we, 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 we're in the gaming business, not the gambling business. We don't want to risk the company, if you will. Um, but online uh, uh, wagering, and I think it will come to the states we operate in, um, uh, we don't have to operate it ourselves. If, if independent operators want to work with us, we certainly look at it. But it is something we could do on our own. Uh, and, uh, and I think it's a pretty good opportunity for us. So. Okay, great. Covered a lot of territory, Dan. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, one final question. Uh, an investor comes to you interested in full house. What is the investment thesis that you share with him? Well, um, you know, there's a team here. It's me and Lewis Fanger and Alex Dollier and a handful of other people have been together for 15 years now. And uh, we have a pretty good track record. I mean, when, when I joined Steve Wynn in 1992 as uh, chief financial officer and head of development, the stock was about $4 a share. And nine years later, the company was sold for $21 a share. Um, we went into Pinnacle when it was a troubled company and in default and bank debt and everything else. We tripled or quadrupled the size of the company. It got sold not long after I left at, a, again, a multiple of where it was. Um, then I had my own company. We sold that at a nice profit. And we're here to make money. I mean, there are people in this industry who have their ego in it and so on. And, and yes, we have fun. We're, we all work together and we enjoy it. But we're here to make money. And so we, we look at opportunities and, and this, it can be a wonderful win, win, win. I mean, if, if you do it right, the customers come and they have a good time. The community gets the jobs and the tax revenues and helps the community. The employees get advancement opportunities. The, the executives make money on their stock options and the shareholders make money on the stock and, and bondholders have an improving credit and everybody wins. And, and that's what I've always done in my career, and it's what we're doing here. Now, you can run the math kind of quickly and say, well, okay, if, if, if you wanted to sell the company today, could you sell it at a profit? Yeah, I'm quite sure we could, okay? But we're still having fun, and I think in five years, it'll be a much bigger number, and, uh, and, that, and that's what we're here. And, and people can run the math. We, we have a fair amount of leverage. Uh, that's a good thing if, you, if, you, if you're good at... Uh, managing the business and staying on top of it. And, uh, um, and so uh, there's, there's a lot of upside here. And uh, that's what I would tell somebody. So was, uh, okay, that's a good story. On, on that note, I guess uh, uh, we're wrapped up. Thanks very much for your time, Dan. Thank you, Frank.